uh, um, today uh, is uh, our guest speaker is Antia, Antia Solaki from ILLC in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is a PhD, sorry, Antje is a PhD candidate at ILLC and um, is also uh, um, is supervised by Sonia and uh, Francesco Berto, Sonia Smets and Francesco Berto. Um, uh, and uh, she is uh, also uh, uh, an organizer uh, herself of uh, the um, seminar in the uh, Logic and Interactive Rationality series uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, recent publication of anti R uh, in, uh, well, forthcoming is um, a paper in Journal of Logic, Language and Information and uh, conference proceedings uh, at the Lori uh, workshop. I think I've been to the first one of the of the series. Um, uh, Erkenntnis, the Logica yearbook, well, all uh, and Wallach uh, workshops are all um, uh, very uh, uh, great venues for uh, uh, logicians. Uh, so Ant is uh, working in the area of uh, obviously of epistemic logic and uh, so her talk uh, is a topic which is uh, very close also to uh, the research here in Milan. Um, so uh, resource bounded reasoning. Uh, it's interesting. We're looking forward to uh, see um, how the dynamic epistemic logic approach to resource boundedness uh, um, uh, approach the problem uh, differently than uh, the approach that we have, for example, here in Milan with uh, depth bounded uh, logic. So, uh, welcome, Antia. Um, for the attendees, uh, the usual rules apply. Uh, please uh, mute your phone. Uh, if you want to uh, intervene, uh, Antia has uh, said this is no problem at all. Um, just uh, type in the chat if you can, or uh, just speak if you uh, want to um, uh, ask a question. And uh, Antti, the floor is yours, and welcome uh, virtually to Milan. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, for joining in this meeting. I'm really happy to be giving this talk after, after all. Uh, so yes, I will talk about uh, ways in which we can uh, bridge logics for knowledge, but also logics for belief with actual human reasoning. Uh, so first, I want to explain what is exactly this gap that we are trying to bridge here. So first, I will give a sort of overview on what is thought of as the standard view of epistemic logic on one hand, and on the other hand, I will discuss some empirical observation on actual human reasoning. Uh, then I will propose a logical framework that uh, I hope it can build bridges between the two. Uh, and I will explain how it can be developed, uh, both in order to accommodate richer logical tools, but also towards building more bridges to popular theories in the psychology of reasoning. And then in the third part, I will uh, discuss a general method that can help us get a sound and complete axiomatization for frameworks like that. And then in the fourth part, I want to argue that exactly the same thing, the same motivation, the same logical tools can be extended to multi-agent systems as well. And therefore, we can get a resource-bounded uh, view on higher order reasoning and on group reasoning as well. Uh, and then I will uh, finally wrap up with uh, some conclusions and ideas for uh, future work. Uh, and uh, uh, your suggestions with respect to that are very welcome. Uh, okay, so let's start with uh, the background on standard epistemic logic, which uh, was developed as a spin-off of modal logic by Hidika and others in the 60s. And uh, in this uh, view, we can account for knowledge in a logical framework by extending the language of propositional logic with an operator K such that K phi uh, reach the agent knows phi. And then we can interpret these formulas with the help of uh, Kripke models uh, that include a set of possible worlds, uh, an accessibility, an epistemic accessibility relation imposed on this set of worlds, 
and this is usually assumed to be a reflexive, uh, symmetric and transitive, an equivalence relation. Uh, and these properties of the accessibility relation are supposed to correspond to specific properties of knowledge. Uh, for example, the factivity of knowledge, that uh, if I know phi, then phi is true, and other properties like uh, positive and negative introspection. And then we have a valuation function that uh, takes a possible world and it assigns to it the set of propositional atoms that are true there. And then we interpret these formulas with respect to a model and the world in a model. Uh, for propositional atoms, we just ask that the atom is included in the respective valuation function. Uh, then the Boolean cases go as uh, usual. And then for knowledge, we say that the agent uh, knows that phi, if and only if, phi is the case at all worlds U that are epistemically accessible from W. Uh, and this type of treatment uh, has indeed generated some uh, useful formalizations of uh, epistemological problems. But it has also been criticized because of the problem of logical omniscience. The fact that knowledge under this type of modeling is closed under logical consequence. And this happens because here in the semantic interpretation for knowledge, uh, we have a quantification over possible worlds. But these possible worlds are deductively closed. So if I know something, then I automatically know all logical consequences of it. But this is clearly uh, unrealistic because real human agents uh, do not have unlimited inferential powers. And this is uh, corroborated by empirical evidence and human reasoning uh, that shows that there is a divergence between logical predictions and uh, human reasoning. Uh, just to give an example, the framing effect shows that uh, people assess logically equivalent formulas differently uh, depending on the frame under which we present the options. Whereas if the logical treatment was right, then was accurate, then um, if I know phi and phi is equivalent to psi, then I also know that psi. Uh, so we clearly see a conflict there. And another type of uh, experiment that shows this, that people are not perfect deductive reasoners is the Wasson selection task. Uh, and uh, it has been called the mother of all reasoning tasks. And this is why I'm going to present it now. Um, so in this experiment, uh, we have uh, participants and we present them with four cards. And each card has a number on one side and a letter on the other. And these here are the visible sides of the, of the cards. And then we ask the participants which cards need to be turned to check whether the following holds that if a card has a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other. Uh, and uh, maybe you have seen this task uh, already. Uh, so the correct answer is that uh, the participants should uh, turn the A card because it depicts a vowel. So if this rule is, uh, correct, is, is true, then we expect to find an even number on the other side. And the other card that we need to turn is this one, seven, uh, because it depicts an odd number, a non-even number. Therefore, if this rule is true, then we expect to find uh, a consonant, a non-vowel on the other side. But it turns out that the people do very bad in this. So less than 10% uh, manages to give the correct answer. Uh, although this task, from a logician's perspective, it involves two rules, uh, modus ponens to uncover uh, the A card and modus tollens to uncover the seven card. And the fact that this, um, that this task that is structurally simple turns out to be so cognitively difficult have attracted the attention of uh, many researchers 
um, and they have uh, uh, they have devised other versions of the task and uh, tested them. Uh, and many schools of thought have emerged in psychology of reasoning um, and proposing different explanations on uh, why this occurs. Uh, and one observation is that there is an asymmetry in applying modus ponens and applying modus tollens. Uh, for example, there are concrete experimental data showing that modus tollens has a lower endorsement rates than modus ponens and also that people have longer reaction times when they have to apply modus tollens than when they have to apply modus ponens uh, and the different schools uh, of thought try to explain this um, asymmetry in different ways but what we can see in any case is that people are not perfect deductive reasoners and uh, this uh, just reminds us that as real people, we have cognitive limitations with respect to our memory, uh, to our time, uh, attention, uh, or as Cherniak puts it, uh, real people are subject to the finitary predicament. Uh, and this has motivated the shift from a notion of uh, ideal rationality which, among others, uh, says that people are uh, perfect uh, deductive reasoners, to a notion of minimal rationality. And in minimal rationality, uh, an agent undertakes some, but not necessarily all, of those actions which are apparently appropriate. And this translates into the agent's ability to perform inferences. So we perform some inferences, but not all of them, so in the selection task, we see that most people apply modus ponens, but not modus tollens. Uh, and this also translates to our ability to eliminate inconsistencies. So we eliminate some of them, but not all of them. Uh, for example, I might eliminate an explicit inconsistency uh, of, the, of the form, um, it is, it's raining and it's not raining, but I might have an implicit inconsistency in my belief set that requires many reasoning steps uh, for me to realize that this is an inconsistency and therefore I might just fail to identify it as an inconsistency. Uh, and um, the crucial point here is what determines this sum, this some actions, some inferences, some inconsistencies. Uh, and I think that one plausible answer to this question is the availability of our resources. Um, the fact that we have a finite cognitive capacity and these reasoning steps that we have to apply come with their own cognitive cost. We saw, from, for example, that modus tollens is more costly than modus ponens. And it is exactly this interplay between our capacity and the cognitive costs of these um, reasoning steps that determines where the, the the cut of lies. So if at some point in a reasoning process we completely deplete our cognitive capacity, then we might fail to perform steps from that point on. And this of course has uh, implications for epistemic logic as well. So we have this gap uh, between the experimental results and the uh, logical predictions. But uh, one might say, that this is just an issue of a descriptive uh, and a normative purpose of modeling. So one might say that, okay, uh, we get, we have this gap, but this is not a problem because our models are not supposed to be descriptive of people's behavior. They're supposed to be normative. We want to model how people ought to reason. So if we observe in the experiments that people don't behave in accordance to our models, then this is not a problem because we, we have different purposes. Uh, but I want to emphasize that these mistakes in the reasoning tasks are systematic. So it seems that there is an underlying reason why deduction is sometimes so cognitively difficult. We are bounded reasoners. And this is uh, relevant also from a normative point of view, because we should not demand that agents reason to an extent that is infeasible given their cognitive limitations. So indeed, we want our models to be normative, okay, we want to model how people ought to reason, but this ought, we want it to imply can. 
Uh, and uh, Johan van Bentham has made a similar point in a nice paper in 2008, where he says that, of course, logic is not, uh, is not psychology, it has its own purposes. Uh, and it's not true that if a logical theory uh, is that if people don't behave in accordance to a logical theory, then this theory is useless. But there is a delicate boundary here. And the following should be obvious that if we have a logical system that claims to focus on human reasoning, and then this system is entirely disjoint from actual reasoning, then this might be a bit alarming. Um, so my, my general goal is to design a logical framework that formalizes this alternative picture of rationality and to break it into uh, subtasks. First thing we definitely want to do is to get rid of the problem of logical omniscience. We want to account for the fact that real people are fallible. They might entertain an incomplete scenario, an inconsistent scenario. But we don't want to go to the other extreme and have agents who are uh, completely irrational and where anything goes with the reasoning. So we want to account for the fact that agents are logically competent. They can perform reasoning steps, some reasoning steps. Uh, but these steps are dynamic, so we cannot capture them only by means of a static framework. And these steps are bounded. They are bounded by our cognitive resources. If we completely exhaust our cognitive capacity, then we might fail uh, to apply them. And uh, just to give an idea what, uh, how are we going to achieve this, on the side of the syntax, we need to introduce explicitly the inference rules applied by the agent as labeled dynamic operators. And then the semantics, we want models that uh, are suitable for non-omniscient agents, so we get rid of logical omniscience. We, we want them to be updated following applications of inference rules to account for the fact that agents take reasoning steps and by taking them, they refine their knowledge. And finally, we want them to be parameterized by cognitive resources to capture the fact that these steps are bounded. Uh, okay. Uh, any question at this point? Okay. Uh, I assume you can hear me because I don't see any... Yes, yes, we yeah. do, we do. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's start with the, with the logical framework. Um, as I said, the, we want to extend the language of standard epistemic logic with dynamic operators standing for applications of inference rules. But before we do so, uh, we need to define some prerequisites to clarify what exactly I mean by inference rule. So you should think of an inference rule rho as a formula that looks like this. Uh, so it leads us from a set of formulas in a given propositional language to another formula P. And uh, clearly this is a set of the premises of the rule and this is the conclusion of the rule. And we will use LR to denote the set of all inference rules given from a given propositional language. Now, another prerequisite that we need is a set of terms so that we can talk also about the cognitive costs of these rules. So we introduce a set T which has elements of the form zero standing. So we introduce them so that we, we have a way in the language to talk about the cognitive cost of a rule rho. And we also introduce another type of term, uh, CP, which is introduced so that we have a way in the language to talk about the cognitive capacity of the agent. Uh, okay, and with this in place, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, give the, our uh, epistemic language, which is an extension of the standard one. So we still have atoms, Boolean formulas, uh, an operator K, but on top of these components, we have some extra stuff. We have linear inequalities based on our terms that are supposed to capture uh, comparisons between cognitive costs and the cognitive capacity of the agent. This is why we needed uh, the set of terms as a prerequisite. Then another new element is this operator A, 
which is such that a ro reads the agent has acknowledged rule ro as truth preserving. So the agent has that rule available to apply. Uh, and the crucial case is these dynamic operators labeled by inference rules such that rho phi reads uh, after applying the rule rho, phi is true. And just to see some examples of formulas in this language, this here is a well-formed formula which says that the cognitive capacity of the agent exceeds the cognitive cost of rule rho and the rule is available to the agent. And this is also a well-formed formula, which says that after applying the rule rho, the agent comes to know uh, that phi. Okay, so in this language, we can talk, we can compare uh, cognitive cost and capacity, we can talk about applications of inference rules, things that we couldn't do in the standard epistemic language. But now, how are these uh, formulas interpreted? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask can I ask a question? So yeah, yeah. Uh, you say um, after application of rule row uh, formula phi is true. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there is there is no specification about the premises which make uh, applying rho uh, becoming phi true. Uh, is that correct? The the premises uh, even through the definition of the rule, because the rule is essentially the pair of the premises and the conclusion. So uh, when you use a rule rho, Im implicit in its its uh, definition is also the premises and its conclusion. But you could you could apply the same rule to different, or or is is actually so the rule is not a schema, but it's really an instance. Mm. Of yeah, it is an instance. Yes. I will uh, also talk about it uh, later. So, for example, a uh, rule rho here can be an instance of uh, of more exponents. So, after this formula, we then say that after applying that instance of more exponents, phi is true. So th that would be like saying after if a implies b, a therefore b, then b is true. Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. That's the idea. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, and I will continue. Uh, yes, with the models that we will use to interpret this type of uh, formulas. Uh, well, first, we need to uh, fix two things. First is the uh, which are the resources that we want to consider. So if, for example, we want to focus on time and the working memory of our agent, then we take a set res that has two elements, uh, time and memory. And then we fix a cognitive cost function that takes an inference rule and it assigns to it a cognitive cost with respect to its resource. So this cognitive cost function can take an instance of modus tollens and assign to it a cognitive cost with respect to time. How much time does it take to apply the rule? Uh, with respect to memory, how many working memory units are required to apply the rule, and so on. And uh, this function is supposed to be empirically informed uh, in the sense that there are experimental findings on the difficulty of inference rules as schemes. I mentioned, for example, that uh, uh, different theories uh, explain the um, uh, difference between in the difference in difficulty between modus tollens and modus ponens, and likewise for other um, other schemes of rules. Uh, and I know Marcello is also um, uh, interested in that. Uh, but there are also experimental findings that we can use um, on the difficulty of particular instantiations of these rules, which has to do with the logical complexity of the premises and the conclusion. Um, so there is this research line in cognitive science that uh, focuses on the on the cognitive difficulty of Boolean concept acquisition. So this function is supposed to be empirically informed in the sense that it can utilize findings and uh, well interdisciplinary evidence and uh, and theories uh, having to do both with uh, schemes and particular instantiations. Okay, and with this. Uh, we can define a resource-sensitive model uh, which will contain impossible worlds. 
And uh, impossible worlds have been proposed already from the 70s to overcome large scale omniscience. Uh, there, the idea is that uh, these worlds are not closed under any notion of logical consequence. So they can represent an inconsistent scenario, they might represent an incomplete scenario. And if we allow these worlds to be in the model and knowledge to also quantify over them, then we immediately break this disclosure principles of logical omniscience. Because I might know something without knowing a consequence of it. Uh, but the problem there is with this type of approaches is that you usually go to the other extreme. So you have agents that are completely irrational, anything goes with the reasoning, and this is something that we want to avoid here. This is why the models will be a bit more, um, will have uh, more components. Uh, so a resource sensitive model is a tuple that contains a set of possible worlds, a set of impossible worlds. Then an epistemic accessibility relation imposed on them. Then we have evaluation function taking care of the possible world, assigning to each one of them the propositional atoms that are true there, so as in the Kripke models. And we have evaluation for the impossible world that assigns to each one of them all the formulas, atomic or complex, that are true there. So in impossible worlds, the evaluation assigns values directly and not recursively as we do it with um, the possible worlds. Uh, and then we have another component, uh, function R, that takes uh, a world and it yields the rules that the agent has acknowledged there. And finally, we have a CP now as a component of the model. Uh, which stands for the cognitive capacity of the agent, uh, what the agent can afford with respect to its resource. So it uh, it uh, captures how much time I have avail available to reason, how many uh, working memory units I have, and so on. Uh, and the reason I use the same name, CP, as a term in the language and as a component of the model is because uh, the one will correspond to the other in the in the semantics. Uh, okay, so this is the definition of the resource sensitive model. Uh, but of course, we might want to impose some conditions on it. Uh, for example, uh, let's start with the accessibility relation. Uh, as I said, usually people assume that epistemic relations are equivalence relations. And this is something that we can assume here as well. I will just notice that uh, we definitely want the relation to be reflexive because this ensures that knowledge is factive. If I know something, then it is true. But for uh, symmetry and transitivity, we can remain a bit agnostic because with them, um, they usually correspond to positive and negative introspection. And from the perspective of bounded uh, agents, this is something that we might want to, to avoid, but I will discuss it uh, later towards the end. Um, and then another condition we might want to have here uh, has to do with minimal rationality, because this also translates to ability to eliminate inconsistencies. We eliminate some, but not all of them. But of course, we have to start somewhere. So this is why I impose minimal consistency, which says that no uh, impossible world uh, represents an explicit inconsistency of the form phi, not phi. Uh, okay, this is just to ensure that there is a minimum of how inconsistent an impossible world can be. And another condition is soundness of rules, which basically says that if a rule is available to the agent, then this rule is truth preserving. And this is just to ensure that um, the rules are, are truth preserving, therefore, the knowledge of agents um, is built on, on truth-preserving rules, so it, uh, knowledge is factive, basically. Uh, okay. So at this point, we can already see the semantic clauses, the truth conditions for the static part of the language, and we will discuss the um, dynamic rule operators uh, later. So first thing we need to do is to see how the terms are interpreted. So CP as a term in the language is interpreted in a model M 
by taking the value of cognitive capacity from the model. And uh, C rho as a term in the language is interpreted in M by taking the value that the empirical uh, cost function assigns to the rule rho. And then for in, in impossible worlds, the formulas get their value directly from the uh, respective valuation function. Okay, because these impossible worlds are supposed to behave in this um, in this uh, non-recursive way. Uh, but for impossible worlds, we evaluate formulas uh, as um, as um, given here. So for propositional atoms, we ask that the atom is included in the respective valuation. For linear inequalities, we ask that the inequality holds once we assign the suitable values to the, to the terms. Uh, the Boolean cases are uh, standard. This is why I didn't write them down. Uh, then for the availability of rules, we ask that the rule is included in the availability function of that world. And for knowledge, we ask that phi is the case at all worlds that are epistemically accessible from W. But notice that here, this also includes impossible worlds. So knowledge quantifies over possible and impossible worlds, and this is instrumental in avoiding logical omniscience. Okay, so this is the these are the clauses for the static part. But of course, in our um, framework, we also have these dynamic rule operators. And we need model updates, as I said, because we want to uh, reflect on the model. We want to encode that by applying an inference rule, the agent refines her knowledge, refines her epistemic state. Uh, and the intuition behind the behind the definition of the update of a model induced by an application of raw is that some worlds in the new model might be eliminated because by applying the rule i might come to realize that i entertained an inconsistent world therefore this world will be eliminated in the new model another thing is that worlds might be refined because by applying the rule I also come to know the conclusion of it. So in a way, uh, some words in the model will be refined in that they now represent also the conclusion of the rule. And uh, another thing that happens is that the cognitive capacity on the updated model should be reduced by the cost of applying that inference rule. Uh, so just to see the formal definition of this model, of this uh, model update, we have a resource sensitive model M and an inference rule Rho. Then the update induced by Rho yields a new model where the new set of possible worlds uh, is restricted to those possible worlds where the agent knows the premises of the rule. The agent has the rule available to apply and the cognitive capacity of the agent exceeds the cognitive cost of the rule. And then the impossible worlds in the new model are uh, restricted to those that at least represent the premises of the rule. And they are not uh, ruled out by minimal consistency. And what I mean by that is that uh, exactly by applying this inference rule, we might realize that we entertain an inconsistent world. And that inconsistent world that we have unveiled as being inconsistent well, should be eliminated. It cannot survive in the updated model. Uh, that's the idea behind the definition of the new uh, set of impossible worlds. Uh, then the accessibility relation will just be um, restricted to the surviving worlds. Uh, same for the valuation function of the possible worlds. But for the valuation function of the impossible worlds, what happens is that uh, they, it is extended by the conclusion of the rule. Because we want to represent that the surviving impossible worlds become refined by the application of the rule. So they now also represent its conclusion. Uh, and uh, then the rule availability is restricted to the surviving worlds and the new cognitive capacity in the updated model is reduced 
by the cost of applying that inference rule. This is to account for the fact that rule applications are effortful. They do not come for free. And uh, with this, we can give the, the truth conditions for the um, formulas involving uh, rule operators. So we say that uh, after applying uh, rho phi is true, if and only if the agent knows the premises of the rule, uh, the, her capacity exceeds the cost of the rule, the rule is available to her, and phi is the case in the updated model. So in the model that encodes the effect of applying the rule, phi is true. So to break this down, um, this uh, clause has two parts. One is a cognitive precondition that says that premises are known, the rule is cognitively affordable, and the rule is available to the agent. And then phi is the case in the updated model. So we need all of these things to make sure that after applying a rule, phi is true. Okay, and now let's see how these uh, constructions work in uh, through an example. Uh, suppose we have a selection task scenario. We want to model how an agent uh, infers what's on the back of the cards A and 7, given the conditional statement that if there's a vowel on one side, then there is an even number on the other. So at the beginning, a real agent only knows what she sees, that there is a, a vowel in the first card and an odd number in the second card. A real agent has not immediately inferred what is in the back of these cards. This requires some effortful reasoning steps. Modus ponens for this one and modus tollens for this one. Uh, so in order to formalize this, we need to introduce uh, propositional atoms of the form VI, uh, reading the there is a vowel on card I. So what the agent knows at the beginning is V1, that there is a vowel A in the first card, and EI saying that there is an even number on card I. So at the beginning, what the agent knows is that there is a non-even number, not uh, E2 is the case, because um, the agent is uh, an odd number. And the conditional statement simply says, uh, if vowel, then uh, even number. Uh, and then the rules that the agent has to apply to figure out what's in the back is this one, an instance of more disponents to realize that there is an even number on the back of this, and an instance of modus tollens to realize that in the back of the seven card, there can be, there, uh, there is a, a consonant, a, a non-vowel um, card. Uh, but of course, a fallible agent um, will take effort to apply these rules. So at the beginning, she might also entertain an incomplete scenario where she only knows the premises, but not the conclusions of these rules. Or uh, she might also entertain an inconsistent world where, for example, she believes that in the back of the seventh card there is a vowel. And this is uh, the type of agent we will model in this example. So suppose that at the beginning, uh, our agent only knows that there is uh, a vowel in the first card and a non-even card in the second card. So the initial model is this one. This is a possible world, the actual world where there is a vowel A in the first card, therefore an even on the back of it, and a non-even card in the second card, therefore a consonant on the back of it. But our fallible agent entertains an incomplete world where she uh, entertains the, the premises but not the conclusion, uh, and uh, an inconsistent world where the agent uh, entertains the negation of the conclusion of modus tollens. And suppose that we want to focus on the time and the memory of the agent. Uh, both rules are, are available to her. And uh, the cost, of course, of modus tollens is greater than the cost of modus ponens. And our agent comes with a fixed uh, capacity. Uh, then let's see what happens uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, modus ponens updated model. Then what happens, according to our definition, is that the impossible worlds become enriched by the conclusion of modus ponens, namely 
that there is an even number on the back of the A card. Okay, so we add E1 here and here. And we can check that the uh, cognitive precondition of the semantics is satisfied. So uh, the agent knows the premises of mode exponents. The cognitive capacity exceeds the cost of it. The rule is available to her. And in this updated model, it is the case that the agent knows the conclusion of mode exponents, that there is an even number on the back of A. So we can say, according to our semantics, that after applying that instance of mode exponents, the agent comes to know what's on the back of the A card. Now, let's see how a mode stolens update on this model looks like. What will happen there, according to our definition, is that this inconsistent world has to be eliminated because in applying mode stolens, we realize that this has been an inconsistent world. Therefore, this uh, goes away. And the other world, the incomplete one, is enriched with the conclusion of modus tollens, namely that there is a consonant, a non-vowel, on the back of the seven card. But if we look at our semantic clause for rule, app rule applications, the cognitive precondition is not satisfied here because the cognitive capacity of the agent reduced as it is from uh, applying mode exponents is not uh, does not exceed the cost of mode tolerance so uh, the the agent fails to come to know that there is a consonant behind the seven card uh, so here we see one example of a failure that has to do with the fact that a rule is too cognitively difficult it's not cognitively affordable for the agent to apply uh, and uh, this is just one scenario. You can imagine other scenarios with very long reasoning processes and agents with uh, different capacities. And then for these agents, the, the limit on the, on the reasoning process, like what they can perform, what they cannot perform, uh, will be determined by this interplay between their capacity and this uh, accumulated cost of the, um, of the, of the different uh, rules of inference. Okay, so uh, now let's just look back at the desiderata that I mentioned. Uh, first, we do get rid of uh, lots of Kilomnesians because of the impossible worlds, but we avoid the other extreme because our agents can still take reasoning steps in order to enhance their epistemic state, and we explicitly reflect that. But these steps are effortful, so they can only be carried out to the extent that the resources allow, and this parameterization determines the evolution of reasoning and it is empirically informed. So we don't impose an arbitrary cutoff in reasoning saying that uh, uh, agents apply five steps or 10 steps or n steps. This is all determined by the interplay capacity costs. Okay, so this is just a, a logical framework uh, that captures this idea of um, bounded uh, reasoners. Uh, but uh, I have worked on this on this uh, idea uh, with respect to also to other dynamic epistemic logical tools. One of them is plausibility models that are used to capture more fine-grained epistemic notions. So at the same time, we study not only knowledge but also belief, the feasible knowledge, which is a softer notion inspired by Stalinger's um, analysis of knowledge, conditional belief, and also more fine-grained actions of belief revision. So if we bring together this research, uh, if we bring together this research-bounded reasoning and plausibility models, something that we do in this uh, paper with um, Sonia Smets, then we can study uh, the effect of research-boundedness on notions other than knowledge. And we also provide a reduction axiomatization similar, not exactly the same, but similar to what I will uh, present afterwards. And in an extended version of this uh, paper that uh, I hope will be out soon, we combine this with communicative actions because reasoning is, is a mixed task. It involves not only those eternal reasoning steps that we take, but also the external information we get from others. So this is why in that framework we also include public announcements and uh, radical upgrades, which are supposed to be a softer policy of updating uh, your information. Uh, 
But another direction where we can use this uh, idea of reasoning steps is uh, to build more bridges with um, theories in psychology of reasoning. And the popular, uh, the popular family of theories is the dual process theories of reasoning. According to them, cognition is run by two systems. System one, which is supposed to be uh, the fast, uh, involuntary one, which is effortless, uh, governed by our habits and biases. And this is the system uh, that we mainly use in our daily life, it constructs our idea of the world. But then we also have system two, uh, we resort to it for uh, complicated tasks, which is slow, stepwise, rule-based, effortful. Deductive reasoning is uh, this type of uh, an activity of system two. And uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, has written this influential book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And there he talks about this interaction between system one and system two, saying that system one gives the inputs for the explicit beliefs of system two, which constructs thoughts in an orderly series of steps. So in a paper with uh, Franz Berto and Sonia Smets, we develop a logical framework that uh, includes uh, operators for both actions run by system one, integrating information on the basis of background beliefs, and for actions run by system two, exactly this deductive reasoning steps to the extent resources allow. And as case studies, we use the framing effect, uh, the anchoring effect, and stereotypical thinking, all cases discussed in this uh, psychological literature. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is the framework and how it can be implemented in different directions. Uh, now I uh, will just summarize a general method that allows us to get sound and complete axiomatizations for frameworks with impossible worlds. Uh, the problem with impossible worlds is that they make it difficult for us to exploit techniques from model logic, like canonical model construction, to show complete completeness. Uh, so we, we need to take a small detour and reduce our structures with impossible worlds to structures that only have uh, possible worlds and capture the effect of having impossible worlds around through a syntactic function. And syntactic at attempts have been put forward against logical omniscience by Fagin, Halpern and others. Uh, they use these awareness structures um, and they say that the agent, in order to know something, uh, she has to be aware of it. And uh, the awareness function, in uh, they put an awareness function in the Kripke model to show which formulas the agent is aware of. And uh, Van Sink has shown that structures for awareness can be reduced to impossible world frameworks that validate precisely the same formulas. Here, we have an impossible world framework we want to reduce it to a syntactic awareness-like one uh, that only involves possible worlds to be able to exploit methods from other logic. So to put it schematically, uh, Vansing went from structures for awareness to an impossible world framework. Here we have a resource-sensitive impossible world framework. We want to reduce it to a syntactic one just for reasons of um, uh, technical convenience. And I'll just give a sketch of the reduction of the whole thing. Uh, the, the idea is to first enrich the language, the static part, with auxiliary operators that discern quantifications over possible worlds and over impossible worlds. Uh, the clause for knowledge, remember, quantifies over both. Uh, so we need auxiliary operator, one to take care of the possible ones, one to take care of the impossible ones. And then we can build a reduced model that has only possible worlds and an awareness-like function to take care of the impossible ones. And we can show that this validates precisely the same formulas as the original. And then we can show first that there is, uh, we can show that there is a static axiomatization that sound incomplete with respect to the reduced structures. The idea there is that the operator that isolates only possible worlds behaves as a normal model operator. So in terms of this, you can capture properties of the accessibility relation. We can also put, uh, introduce axioms capturing the model conditions. And knowledge then is reduced to the operator that quantifies over possible worlds and the operator that quantifies over impossible worlds. 
But then we also have dynamic operators and usually what we do in uh, dynamic epistemic logic with them is we provide reduction axioms. And reduction axioms are supposed to help us rewrite formulas with, rule, with dynamic operators to formulas containing no such operator. But this is not straightforward here as is with public announcements for example because the new set obtained through the update of the awareness-like function by the application of the rule cannot be described by means of the static language alone. And in light of this, you might say that it is a dead end to try to give reduction axioms, but the, up, the updated value of the awareness-like function, if you write it down, uh, behaves in a very principled way. It just extends, it's the previous one, extended by the conclusion of the rule. Uh, exactly to capture that the agent uh, came to know the conclusion as well. So it is a set expression of the original one. So we can extend our language with set expression operators, a method that's also used in dynamic awareness settings, to capture this principal behavior, and then we can provide reduction axioms. Uh, now there is not really a point in discussing the reduction axioms without showing what the set expressions are. Uh, but if you want to talk about it in the end, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say more on this. Okay, now in this last part, I just want to argue that um, the same uh, gap between the single agent epistemic logic and real reasoners is also observed in multi-agent systems. Because in multi-agent logics, we just have multiple operators for knowledge, one for each agent. Uh, multiple accessibility relations, uh, and then the, the multi-agent epistemic logics will satisfy, among others, that uh, effectivity of knowledge and positive and negative introspection. But the problem of logical omniscient persists because uh, the knowledge of its agent is closed and the logical consequence. And on top of it, uh, there is also empirical evidence regarding people's higher order reasoning. And this evidence challenges assumptions on unlimited introspection. Because if we have bounded agents, then they cannot perform introspection unlimitedly. Um, and also this challenges assumptions on uh, reasoning about others, uh, because for example, in epistemic logic, we can always make attributions to others. We can always uh, evaluate statements like, I know that you know that he knows that she knows and so on. Whereas if we really are finite reasoners and we are, uh, we cannot always process, uh, we cannot always reason about each other at any model depth. Uh, and the empirical evidence uh, on this uh, is built on the crucial notion of theory of mind, which is the cognitive capacity to attribute mental states like knowledge and beliefs to oneself and others. And we have findings showing that there are limits on introspection, people cannot perform it unlimitedly, uh, and this only corroborates the philosophical objections against positive and negative introspection, for example, in the work of Timothy William, Williamson and others. Uh, but it also shows that there are limits on reasoning about others. For example, in strategic games, we see that people systematically fail to apply higher degrees of theory of mind. Uh, for example, there are experiments where we see that people have longer reaction times when they have to reason about the belief of their opponent than when they have to reason about a non dick fact alone. Uh, and as in the single agent case, there are practical and theoretical benefits in breaching logic and this empirical evidence. So, in particular, for multi-agent systems, to build a, a formal framework for intelligent interaction, uh, for example, the cooperation of a human and a machine, then of course you want your agents to be able to reason about each other in an accurate way. Uh, so this motivates the whole attempt and uh, I've been working on how to combine the, the bounded steps idea with multi-agent systems. Uh, and uh, once again, we want to have fallible agents with respect not only to deduction, but also introspection and reasoning about others. But we don't want them to be incompetent. We want to show that they take reasoning steps, both of deduction, but, uh, 
not on, on not only of deduction but also of introspection and of reasoning about others to infer what the other um, what the other infer and so on. But these steps can be carried out only to the extent resources allow, because all these steps come again with cognitive cost for deduction in the way that I have mentioned. For introspection, it's something we can see in studies of implicit cognition. For reasoning about others, it's something we can see in this uh, literature on theory of mind. Uh, but this uh, attempt, this uh, draft that I have written, uh, mostly focuses on the manipulation of um, knowledge and beliefs in a multi-agent uh, setting. So it doesn't account for how we form knowledge and beliefs about others in the first place. And this is something that we did in a paper with uh, Fernando Velasquez Quesada. We focused on, on uh, a framework, a temporal framework, on how agents form beliefs about the others based on observation and communication. Because I might believe that you believe something because I see you seeing something, or I might believe that you believe something because someone told me so. This is what we're trying to capture. The intuition is that we want to have a contrast between a simple semantic model capturing only a bare minimum of facts uh, that real people ca can keep um, track of, and then a complex clause to interpret belief attributions to show that people engage in this uh, difficult process of recalling basic facts of visibility and communication and infer the beliefs of the others on, on their basis. And uh, the case studies in that paper is the is a paradigmatic uh, theory of mind experiments, the false belief tasks. So in that paper, we focus only on observation and now in an extension of this, we also incorporate communication as well in this framework. Uh, now a last uh, bit uh, is something I'm working on currently, bounded group reasoning. Uh, and the reason I'm working on this is because all of this idealization of standard epistemic logic are inherited by its group epistemic notions. Just consider common knowledge. Common knowledge of phi says that everyone knows phi, everyone knows that everyone knows phi, and like that ad infinitum. But this is clearly unrealistic for a finite reasoner. Uh, and once again, there is experimental evidence on how people, groups, do uh, deductive reasoning tasks, for example, the selection task. And um, the, the nice thing with those papers is that the experimenters have the dialogues of the participants. And therefore, you can trace exactly what sort of actions they undertake as a group when they deliberate to resolve the task. And these um, experiments also show that people, that people in groups actually do better than the individuals. Uh, and I think that a nice notion to show this in the, um, with logical uh, means is distributed knowledge. So we say that an agent has distributed knowledge, not an agent, a group of agents has a distributed knowledge of phi. Uh, whenever the members of G, by pooling their no knowledge together, they can use fee. And many people have looked into this intuitive definition um, and criticized it because this doesn't exactly specify what can actualize distributed knowledge, what can turn it into common knowledge, because this intuitive definition assumes that agents can, um, that the groups can undertake uh, possibly unlimited um, actions of uh, communication. So they try to specify which actions of communication can realize distributed knowledge. But I think that from the perspective of bounded agents, it makes sense to also study the actions of inference. Uh, and uh, this is also something demonstrated in the, in the, exper in the experimental dialogues. Uh, so we can see which actions actualize distributed knowledge, but also to which extent distributed knowledge can be actualized given that we have resource-bounded agents. Uh, and with this framework, we can see the collective effort leads to better performance sometimes because collective group effort is, group performance is at the upper limit, the performance of the best member 
who might do all the difficult inferences and then share the result with the others, or because we do a more efficient use of resources. If we come together to resolve a task, we can distribute subtasks, subtasks among us. Therefore, the cognitive burden is, is uh, shared and we might achieve something that we wouldn't achieve if, um, uh, if we were overloaded um, uh, when trying to resolve it uh, individually. Uh, okay, so this is just uh, the gist of um, the attempts regarding multi-agent settings. Uh, the general conclusion that I want to draw out of this is that it's worth to take into account empirical literature and reasoning when designing logical systems, whether they are single agent or multi agent. And uh, the general guide in this, in this uh, project is to reflect explicitly which is this dynamic process underpinning knowledge or beliefs or whatever, and the effort that is required in this. And uh, with respect to this impossible world framework that I presented, there is a general detour method to take us from semantic frameworks with impossible worlds to syntactic ones uh, that allow for the use of uh, model logic techniques in showing soundness and completeness. And uh, some of uh, the ideas for future work include testing logical predictions against experimental predictions. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, evidence regarding the difficulty of the deductive mastermind game, so it would be nice to actually uh, compare. Um, then another direction is seeing whether system one and system two uh, actions can be embedded in the multi-agent uh, framework, which is especially interesting. Uh, and the other thing is probabilistic reasoning, because I have neglected it so far. Uh, but of course, it is part of uh, the rationality debate and it is subject to the same um, considerations given empirical evidence. Uh, and one way we might want to do this is through the pr probabilistic models of dynamic epistemic logic, because there is an equivalence between the plausibility models and probabilistic models. And since we have this framework and reasoning steps within plausibility uh, models, and given this equivalence, there might be something to say also on resource-bounded probabilistic reasoning. But I have not looked into this uh, at all, so um, I don't really know if it is uh, possible. Uh, anyhow, uh, these are some of the references I have mentioned throughout the text, but there are many more if you want to um, discuss about something. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Santi. I think uh, for many uh, motivations behind behind your talk, you have been uh, you've been preaching to the choir, as they use, as they say. Uh, although probably we have uh, a different way of approaching this problem. But I mm -hmm. want to uh, ask if uh, any if there are any questions now. So okay, I'll, I'll go ahead, Paolo. Bye. Go. Yes, yes. So uh, my question is, you allow um, uh, update operations via rules, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, if you were to allow update via a rule schema and not rule license, what would happen? If I understand correctly, uh, the update would only uh, affect the impossible words, right? Or uh, I, I don't know. Have you ever considered this, uh, this option to allow, let's say, update on uh, rule schemas rather than uh, yeah. concrete yeah. listens? Yeah, actually, in the paper on uh, fast and slow thinking, we have used uh, rule schemes and not uh, particular instances. Uh, and in that case, again, that, that was a plausibility model with impossible worlds. What you get is that um, there are different choices on, uh, on which premises you're going to apply the scheme on. Uh, so then the updates are given, there are, mo there are more than one update following an application of a scheme. Um, uh, but I think that this indeed affects only impossible worlds in the sense that the impossible worlds are the ones whose valuation can change because of this application. The possible worlds are deductively closed, so nothing changes for them. Okay, yeah, that's what I expect. Okay, thanks. Thank you. 
Anyone? Okay, I, I'll go with my question. So my question is more of a, sort of maybe a conceptual uh, one. Um, I tend to agree that um, one might see uh, uh, bounded agents as being uh, resource bounded, right? So having having a cost to put a cost on on the resources. Um, on the other hand, it seems to me uh, somewhat uh, uh, unusual to 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 think of an agent who can apply the same rule, so the same the same rule, uh, only a, a, a given number of times, and no more than that. It's like if a, a, and here I might have. Uh, uh, so tell me if I'm completely mistaken with respect to this, but it seems to me that in, in, in the model you are designing, the same agent might be uh, uh, might be knowing, say, only modus ponens, and after a finite number of applications of modus ponens, uh, it might not be able to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So this to me seems a little bit. To me, it sounds a little bit strange because I mm -hmm. would expect. Uh, uh, I, I would agree uh, that um, uh, uh, embeddings of the same rules or iterations of the same rules make the rule more complex, and therefore, uh, at some point, the edges is no longer able to do that. This is, for example, something that happens with that bounded logic, right? So you might be able to apply only a number of iteration of the same rule, uh, but the same rules is applied individually, it's fine. You can you can do that as many times as you want because you know the rule. Mm -hmm. So that to me seems, uh, I want to know whether you have a comment on that, on that mm -hmm. observation. Yeah, uh, yeah, so you're right that, um, uh, for example, having an agent who uh, by applying uh, more exponents multiple times might exhaust her capacity might sound a bit strange, but this is something that you can accommodate provided that you assign a very small cost to more exponents since uh, it is also in the, in the psychological literature considered a primitive rule, so something that we very easily apply. Um, but um, the, the issue, at least with the experiments, is that they usually ask for an intuitive answer because the experiments want to test like what is the logic's place in, in human reasoning. So they go for the intuitive answer, the one you give um, like almost immediately. And this is why there it, um, it makes sense to say that the capacity is, is uh, depleted when it comes to applying some difficult rules. Whereas in reality, uh, if we have um, a larger cognitive capacity, for example, if we have more time to reason or we have uh, more memory units, for example, because we take notes, then we will have much longer reasoning processes. So uh, I, I get your point, but I think uh, you can tweak a bit the cognitive cost and the cognitive capacity of the agents and um, and uh, like Taylor make it like closer to the um, to the actual situation. Um, it's time. Does this answer the question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I I see that you can you can do that type of, of work. Um, um, I have another question. It's it's related, so I'll just go ahead with it. Uh, uh, so what about? Um, so in the model, you have a, um, a cost associated to each individual rule. Of course, you can also, uh, you could also define um, a function, uh, say a composition function on costs, if you if you if you would like, uh, and say, okay, if I apply modus ponens, um, it costs uh, 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 one, and if I apply uh, modus ponens in uh, an instance that has a modus ponens as a premise, then it um, costs uh, n uh, one to n, say, or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. uh, I, I wonder whether you have thought about those type of of uh, composition mm -hmm. function composition, or on yeah. the cost, so that you can generalize and not be. It seems to me that in, in this way you will be more free to say uh, something about uh, composition uh, schemas or rules. Hmm. Yes, uh, no, that's true. I haven't thought of, uh, of that, of composition functions. Um, uh, 
what I want to say in this is that uh, if you have an instance of, of any rule that has more complicated uh, premises, then this might be uh, accommodated through the um, this, uh, findings on uh, uh, Boolean concept acquisition. So the same scheme with different premises might have different costs. Um, another thing I want to say with respect to that is that um, there are different schools of thought in psychology focusing on this and uh, they give different explanations on this difficulty. So some associated with uh, the mental logic school associated with the steps in a mental derivation that you have to do. Uh, for example, then modus tollens is not a primitive rule, so you need to apply more steps to infer modus tollens. This is why it's more difficult. Or another view, the mental models one, says that um, the difficulty is correlated with how many mental models um, uh, a situation, a reasoning problem uh, generates. Uh, so there are, you can find different measures of this, and I don't know, but maybe some of these uh, measures also um, uh, can also give some uh, insights on uh, what happens with uh, with compositions of uh, rules. But I haven't looked into it. So yeah, thanks. Giuseppe, cool. may I? Marcello, please. No, ju just uh, uh, a general comment uh, uh, rather than a question. Um, I enjoyed the talk very much, and I have also downloaded some of your papers from academia, and uh, I promise I will read them because, of course, as Giuseppe said, this is very much related to a lot of work we have been doing over the last 10 years, starting in, um, I mean, originally this, this approach uh, that we call death-bounded Boolean logics started in mm -hmm. uh, in 2009 with, um, with the paper in Synthes with Luciano Flori, but then we, yeah. I wrote several papers in theoretical computer science. The origin of our approach was different because uh, your main inspiration, as, as I understand it, uh, but as I said, I will read your papers, comes from cognitive psychology, right? And, uh, and uh, cognitive science in general. Our main inspiration was uh, uh, um, came from philo uh, two, two main problems. One, one problem is a philosophical problem, which was the one addressed by Jaco Hintica in uh, mm. his book on analytics versus synthetic uh, mm. Um, inferences in uh, first order logic, and according to Hintika, uh, propositional logic at, you know is, is analytic in the full sense of the world, which of course we found uh, um, you know a conclusion a, a bit unacceptable as a conclusion because of the probable intractability of of, uh, of propositional logic, and so we address this philosophical problem of distinguishing between analytic and synthetic inferences in propositional logic. At the same time, uh, this was also addressed to uh, solving uh, uh, another problem, which is which is more, uh, um, uh, which which is um, arises mainly in computer science and automated deduction, mm. which is uh, the problem of adding tractable approximations of uh, intractable logics, right? Or, or, or probably intractable logic. So we found an approach which was actually uh, addressing both situations. I, uh, so this is the general, probably the, the general, the, this explains uh, why you, you go, uh, uh, you know, you go much more deeply about fine tuning with uh, uh, questions of cognitive cost of this sort of stuff, whereas we were a bit, uh, you know, we, we allow for closure operation that, as Giuseppe said, rightly, for instance, if you have the simple rule, this that doesn't, that doesn't matter whether you apply it a hundred times or, or one time, because what counts is uh, uh, the, the cost of, of, the perf of carrying out the inference, the, the whole inference, compared to the cost of reading and understanding the input problem, right? So, in fact, uh, we, we also checked that with our students in, in a number, you know, in a number of years uh, recently because we use this system also to teach logic, and we we realize that if we have what uh, the, the basic set of rules that we call the zero death logic, the, the easiest uh, mm -hmm. logic, which is a nice closure properties because it's a Tarskian logic, which means it is. Uh, 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 you know, it is all the task and property, reflexivity, monotonicity, and transitivity. 
And uh, it's the, 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 the easiest uh, computationally and cognitively task and logic. We actually have, I think, Giuseppe, you can agree on that. We realize that it doesn't really matter how long the, 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 the sequence of applications of this rule is. Once they have learned how to apply modus ponens, uh, uh, we include also modus tollens, about which I will say a couple of, a couple of things uh, in a moment. But uh, I mean, once they have learned how to apply disjunctive syllogism and modus ponens, uh, they can apply actually as many times as they want. It, it is not more difficult because the, just because the proof is longer, right? They take more time, of course, <laughs> because anyway, the input is longer. And so this was the, the uh, it's probably the main difference. Uh, I, I agree with you, we do entirely, that uh, uh, at an initial stage, um, going back to, to, the, to, to the beginning of your talk, to waste an experiment uh, that, of course, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, we have um, you know, we, we know, I mean, although I've never worked on, 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 on the psychology reasoning personally, uh, but uh, uh, I agree entirely that at the beginning, uh, people are more reluctant I mean, find it more difficult to recognize as a correct uh, inference pattern than modus ponens. However, uh, there are two considerations here, and then I will, I'm, I'm done, right? The first consideration is that uh, even, you know, our, stu our first year students, after the first week, right, once they have uh, really learned, uh, you know, why modus ponens, uh, modus ponens is correct, they apply, they apply it mechanically. They don't even... Mm -hmm. reason about it anymore, just, just like they apply modus ponens. So this would be a kind of learning a basic rule that uh, might actually uh, make easy things that uh, were difficult at the beginning. But this takes uh, very little. For... There is another distinction that we make in our approach, which is in, in fact does, doesn't have this property, is a distinction between uh, inferences that require the use of what we call virtual information that would mm -hmm. be like uh, uh, assuming temporary hypothesis, like in the discharge rule of natural deduction. And as Giuseppe mentioned, is the nesting of these rules, uh, of, of these inference steps that require the use of actual information that cannot be, that is really costly even for trained logicians, not only for, uh, yeah, yeah. for, uh, for uh, a first year student in their first week, right? So uh, this distinction, uh, of course, is, it's, it's, it's at, at a level of, of abstraction, which is much higher than yours. So your, your framework uh, uh, does a lot of, uh, has a lot of subtleties uh, because we are just not, uh, not addressing these problems. But, uh, you know, I, I was wondering whether maybe you will have in the future the opportunity of taking a look uh, of some of these papers. And it would be interesting to know what you think, if you think there might be. Oh, sorry, last thing about the modus tollens. In fact, what you can, you, what you can show, given the distinction between uh, uh, rules that, that make no use of virtual information, uh, which are assumptions that are discharged, and rules that make use of virtual information, if you characterize uh, the conditional in terms of modus ponens, which is a widely accepted rule and easily recognized. And in terms of the rule of introduction of uh, false conditions, which means if the antecedent is true and the, and the consequent is false, then the conditional is false. This is something that any first year student, his first day of logic agrees, right? And he can apply these rules. Then you can see that modus tollens with respect to, to these two rules requires only an application of this rule that uses virtual information. And in fact, you can show then that in some sense, if you start from modus ponens only and the rule for introducing a false condition, then modus ponens is more difficult unless you, you add it to the stock or rules. But the explanation we give for this difficulty is that if you start from modus ponens only, then uh, uh, deriving modus tollens uh, makes use of, of uh, virtual information. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I, I put it very shortly, but I didn't want to take too much time. Yeah. Then there will be maybe at other occasions to talk about this. Maybe if you come and see us in presence sooner or later, we will have the opportunity mm -hmm. to discuss it. No, thanks. That's uh, very interesting. Uh, so I think that uh, what you described with your students is what I meant by testing logical predictions against experimental predictions. I guess with experience, you can also do that. Uh, yeah, I have looked into your uh, work on, on the introduction of uh, virtual information. 
um, in the, also in that work, I think with uh, with Floridi. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what I think about this is that there is um, there is a parallel narrative between psychology of reasoning and this uh, and this uh, sort of um, theorizing over the difficulty uh, of rules. Um, uh, so I think that uh, the connection that might be there between what you're saying and virtual information and the more uh, psychological uh, theories is that maybe in, in keeping what you say in virtual information is actually it can be seen as a burden on working memory. Exactly, uh, I agree. Which applies to everyone, trained or, on, or untrained uh, in logic. Exactly. So, yeah, so I think that uh, your observations, I have not uh, looked into this um, in, in detail, but I think that there might be um, a way to, to, combine, to combine them with at least uh, two schools in, in psychology of reasoning that, uh, that studied this. That would be interesting. I haven't done it, but... Yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's have an exchange about this. Uh, yes, I, 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 will, I will look into it. It's very interesting to see if... Um, where you can cure or, or not. Um, and another thing I wanted to say is about the, uh, the training uh, parameter in this. So indeed, if you are if you study logic, then you get your uh, introduction courses, then of course these rules are immediately uh, easier for you. And this is something that's not really reflected here because uh, this is mostly for untrained subjects, the subjects of the experiments. Um, how I think uh, we can maybe extend this framework to this um, to the diversity of agents with respect to training is by having maybe individual cognitive costs of rules because the cognitive cost of a rule might not be the same for a very experienced mathematician compared to a completely untrained uh, yes. subject. So this might be. Um, a, a way to accommodate this Another because dimension. I agree. Yeah, because I agree with you that it, it makes a difference. That's true. Um, uh, okay, so and I will look um, in, in more detail on the depth bounded. Um, I, I will send you. I will yeah. send you. Uh, yeah, thank you very packets, much. Uh, you know, whenever I, I I I get a chance. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. Sorry for taking so much time. Oh, it's uh, it was very interesting to me. Any anyone else questions or request of clarification? All right, then uh, I think uh, we can uh, thank uh, Anti very much for her talk. Uh, we really hope to to have you sometime uh, yes. soon in presence for real. I and, hope so uh, too. <laughs> Uh, for more for more exchanges. Thanks, Anti. Yes, and, thank you uh, very much for having me. <laughs> and for and hopefully we see each other soon somewhere. Yes, yes. I mean, we are interested in the same things, so uh, this is very likely. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much thank again. Much. Thanks, bye, Anti. Bye. Thank you to everybody. Okay. Yes, thanks uh, everyone for attending as usual. And uh, uh, next talk is uh paulo if i'm not wrong is next